In the contemporary church, we, we err a lot on knowing God. And, and the result of us uh, preaching almost exclusively and teaching almost exclusively on knowing God and, and not about knowing ourselves and dealing with ourselves has led to disastrous consequences. Marriages have been betrayed. Families have been destroyed. Ministries and careers have blown up because countless people, they know God, but they don't know themselves. A number of people have been hurt and damaged because they know God, but they don't know themselves and they don't deal with themselves. See, part of the reason that there are so many pretenders in the body of Christ is because we have a lot of head knowledge about God. But we haven't allowed that head knowledge to lead to real internal change and transformation. Because what that involves is also deeply knowing yourself. If you don't know that you are in need, you will never know God as a provider. If you don't know that you are broken, then you will never know God as a healer. If you don't know that you are lost in sin, then you will never know God as a savior. We got here because from the very beginning, one of the main consequences of sin is that sin gave us an identity that was different from what God created us to have. But as we get started today, if we're going to come out of hiding, then number one, we have to take off the false self. The false self starts with the lies that we choose to believe. The core of the lie that Adam and Eve believed is that they could be like God without God. But that is impossible. We can't be like God apart from God. We can't live out our true identity apart from the one who created us. Whenever we choose a way of being and living that is separate from God, that's when we begin to put on a false self. It starts off as a cover-up, a false self, but because we wear it for so long, then it morphs into an identity. What began as a, a few fig leaves, so many of us ends up turning into a wardrobe of fig leaves. Only people who are wearing fig leaves are bothered by folk who are naked. When you are okay with who you are, and when you are doing you, and when you don't need anybody else to sign off on your identity, it doesn't bother other people that are secure in who they are. It only bothers fig leaf wearing people. Hey, Amen. Come on, let's give God a praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right where you are, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this incredible opportunity for us to just be alive and to worship together. And as we come to your holy word, we pray now, Father, that you would speak to us clearly. Lord, stand up in me and speak what you need us to hear. Thank you for the power of your word, Jesus. And we come to it now with expectation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and let the church say amen. Well, good morning to each and every one of you. It is always a joy for us to be able to be alive and to be in uh, the house of God. And so to our Derby family, God bless you. Good morning to those of you that are worshiping with us online from a variety of places and cities. We are, uh, and even countries, we're honored to have you. And to our guest, uh, Pastor Brittany did such a great job welcoming you. But I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, we are so honored to have you. And uh, at the close of service, our prayer team will be out front, and I'm going to be down front with some of our other campus pastors. We'd love a chance to connect with you uh, and just to shake your hand and welcome you uh, in a more formal way. I want you to join me as we start week two of this teaching series, The Blessing of Being Yourself. In Ephesians chapter three, it was our focus scripture this morning in our time of prayer and uh, in also reading the word of God earlier in our service. And I want to call your attention back to it. The B clause of verse 17 is really where I want to start. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the believers at the church in Ephesus. And he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high, some translations say how low is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. In this second week of this teaching series, The Blessing of Being Yourself, we want to talk this morning about knowing yourself. Knowing yourself. Now, we started this teaching series on last Sunday, and we began to talk about how it's pretty normative in the contemporary church for us to focus almost exclusively on knowing God. But a part of our ability to really grow in our faith and to know God also involves knowing and dealing with ourselves. So on last Sunday, we started with going back to the beginning with Adam and Eve because in order for you to really fully know yourself and to know God, you have to take off that false self that we saw as pictured in Adam and Eve when sin entered the world hiding behind fig leaves. But on today, we want to take this next step in this series and talk now that the false self has been exposed and hopefully removed about really knowing ourself. In order to fully be yourself, you have to fully know yourself. And knowing ourselves has to begin by knowing the real self that is known by God. This is, in fact, what the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate to the believers at the church at Ephesus when he's talking about the love of God. He's trying to get them to understand that the way that God sees you, the self that is known to God, is so precious that God loves that much. He, he, he tries his best to try to uh, define and help them get a glimpse of how, how all-expansive and all-encompassing the love of God is. And that's important because genuine self-knowledge begins by looking at God and noticing how he's looking at you. See, grounding our knowing of self in, in how God knows us and how God sees us, it anchors us in the real truth and it also anchors us in God. And so if you're going to know yourself, then number one, you have to know this. Number one, you have to know yourself as deeply loved. Number one, you have to know yourself as deeply loved. We must know that God loves each and every one of us with a, with, with a depth and a persistence and an intensity that is beyond really imagination. This is what Paul is trying to find the words to say. He says, I, I, I hope that you can even grasp how, how high and how wide and how, how deep the love of God is. He, he's saying it, it's hard to really wrap your mind around, but I hope that God gives you um, some kind of, of inkling into an understanding of how deeply loved you are. You must know that God doesn't simply like you. God doesn't have just warm, sentimental feelings towards you. Uh, matter of fact, one scholar said it this way, God loves you with a passionate, absorbed interest. In Isaiah 49, God describes it this way. He says that I have written you on the palms of my hand. I remember back in the day when I was younger and I didn't want to forget something, I would write it on my hand. God says, you are, you are that loved by me that I have written your name on the palms of my hand. See, what I want you to understand is, is God cannot help but see you through eyes of love. Because you're loved that deeply by God. And what's even more remarkable is that God's love for you has nothing to do with your behavior. That's significant. When you go back to John 3, 16 and, and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So much in just those two verses. For God so loved the world, the sinful world, the, the chaotic world, the divided world. And you can add any other adjective you want to add, but God loves the world. That is a statement that is not predicated on behavior. It says that God so loved the world, as jacked up as our world is, God loves it. 
And then he says, and he sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. That all speaks of a love that is not predicated on behavior. See, you must understand that neither your faithlessness nor your unfaithfulness alters the love of God for you in the slightest degree. One of the best illustrations of this, because I, I know sometimes we, we've, we, we have a hard time really comprehending the love of God because we think that God loves us the way that other people love us. We think that God's love is predicated on our behavior. So sometimes it's hard to really, to, to really grasp this. But one of the greatest um, pictures of the love of God is this image that, that depicts the, the father whose son was lost in, in Luke 15. We call it the prodigal son. But if you've been around the worship center long enough, you know that I've taught this often. And, and when I teach it, I hope you to understand that, that the son was not the prodigal one. We think the prodigal means lost, but the true definition of prodigal means extre extremely or extravagantly uh, lavish. And so this son that, that leaves and squanders everything that he had ends up um, falling on his face, living in a pig pen, covered in mess and dirt and grime, starts coming home, and it's his father who's prodigal. Because his father, while the son was a long way off, runs to the son, puts his arm around him. His father is recklessly extravagant in how he loves this son because the son doesn't have to clean up. The son doesn't have to change clothes. The son doesn't have to do anything different for the love of the father. It's one of the greatest illustrations of the love that God has for us. God's love for us is absolutely unconditional, unlimited, and unimaginably extravagant. Once again, this is what Paul is really struggling to, to put into words. This is why he says, I, I, I just pray, I pray you can grasp how high is the love of God. He says it, it means it doesn't matter how high you go. God's love will still find you there. He says, I, I hope you can grasp just how wide. I love that because it means no matter how far you are to the left or how far you are to the right, you're still within God's love. Yeah. Uh, or, or how deep, it means that no matter how low you go, how far you fall, you are still within the grip of God's love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Family, we need to know that love is our identity. It's our calling. We're children of love. God is love. The Bible says we were created from God created from love, of love, and for love. Our existence makes no sense. Our identity makes no sense apart from God's love. And this desire to know yourself, this desire to even know God, you can't get very far unless you begin with understanding just how deeply you are loved by God. And a part of this a big part of this is understanding that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing you can do, nothing you can fail to do, nor uh, nothing that somebody has done to you or should have done for you or didn't do for you. None of that can separate you from the love of God. I'm teaching better than you responded, by the way. But, but, but in Romans 8, Paul, once again, he's trying to help us to understand this. He says, who shall separate us? Doesn't matter if you've had to deal with difficult people or trifling people. He says, they can't separate you from the love of God. Who can separate us, separate us from the love of Christ? Then he goes on and says, not just the who, but let's talk about the what. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. He says, I'm convinced. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Yes, Why? Because he loves us. That's the word by itself. Paul says, I know you're going to come through that thing conquering. Why? Because he loves you. I know that you may be down now, but you're going to end up on the top. Why? Because he loves you. He says, in other words, I know that you may have stumbled upon some difficult times, but I know when it's all said and done, God will take it and make that thing mean for your good. Why? Because he loves you. Then he goes on and says, for I am convinced. He says, 
I got experience. I'm convinced of this, that neither death nor life, neither angels, neither demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying, that's how much God loves you. And family, you have to understand this. If you don't grasp how deeply you are loved by God, then as it relates to spiritual maturity, you're still in kindergarten. Because it starts right there. And so in order for us to know how deeply God loves us, and in order for that love to be transformational, that has to be the basis of our identity. See, our identity is, is who we experience ourselves to be. It's, it's the I that we carry around. And, and our identity has to be grounded in God. That means, and it has to be grounded in God's love. That means that the first thing that you ought to think about when you think about who you are ought to be how deeply loved by God you are. But so often, that's not the case. So often for us, the first thing we think about when we think about our identity is what we do. Yeah. Hi, my name is Van, I'm a pastor. Hi, my name is, is Charles, and I'm an attorney. Or hi, my name is Janet, and I'm a doctor. So often we associate our identity, our who, with our do. But your do is not your who. The first thing that you ought to think about when, when you think about your who is that you are deeply loved by God. This is how Jesus' life was based. Jesus did not base his identity based on what he did. His identity was secured in who he was from the very beginning. In Matthew 3 and verse 13, when he's coming to John to be baptized, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. This is around verse 13 of Matthew 3. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. There it is. And with him, I'm well pleased. Y'all, Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't turned water into wine. He, he hadn't uh, fed 5,000 with fish and loaves of bread. He hadn't called Lazarus from the tomb. He hadn't uh, opened the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. He hadn't done anything yet. Why is that important? Because he understood that his who was not predicated on his, on his do. His identity was not about what he did. His identity was about how much the Father loved him. Everything that Jesus did flowed out of his understanding of how much God loves him. Even when Jesus felt abandoned in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew that the Father loved him so much that he was able to settle it and say, but nevertheless, Dad, not my will, but your will be done. Even when he didn't feel it, he knew that God loved him. But maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, but, but see, Bishop, but Jesus is the Son of God, so of course the Father loved him. Well, there are several examples all through Scripture of this extravagant, radical kind of love. One of my favorites is the uh, encounter that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman in John 4. John 4 and 4, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. Now, that's a statement in and of itself because what you must understand is that when Jews would make their trek from Galilee to Judea, they would literally go around Samaria to avoid Samaritans because Samaritans were different religiously. Samaritans were different racially. And so Jews considered Samaritans an impure people and they would avoid Samaritans at all costs, but not Jesus. It says he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near a plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Now, the other important piece about the time is that there was a set time for unclean people to come to the well because they, they had to come to the well at a separate time 
from others that were considered clean because if you mingled with unclean people, sinful people, you would be considered clean, I mean unclean and sinful. So he gets to the well at the exact time that only unclean people can be there. It says, he got there about noon and a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, will you give me something to drink? Now, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. They didn't even want to come to the well. They didn't want to go through Samaria. And the Samaritan woman said, now you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Samaritans were outcasts. They were outcasts religiously, racially, and this woman was an outcast in a greater way because she was considered a sinful, unclean person. This woman is astounded by how Jesus treated her. He approached her instead of avoiding her. He, he talked with her instead of ignoring her and, and acting like she didn't even matter. And then to, to, to go a step further, he asked for something from her. Would you give me something to drink? All of this surprised her greatly. And then, if you know the story, he put his finger on her moral failure and says, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, you've had five husbands and uh, the man you're with now, he's, he's not even your own husband. But, but even after he puts the finger of his on her moral failure, the expected did not happen. He didn't condemn her. He didn't even say, now daughter, go and sin no more. Instead, after, watch this, he revealed her to herself. And he revealed himself to her as the Messiah. She was touched by the love of God, left, and went to the town to tell everybody about Jesus. Why? Because she had encountered the love of God. She, she, she didn't encounter a man that said, shame on you. I can't believe you call yourself this. No, she was encountering the love of God. You mean to tell me that I'm a Samaritan, I'm a sinful woman, and you still want to be associated with me? You still um, think that I'm dignified enough to have, have a drink of water with? She was touched by the love of God, and, and it was that love that led her to be the very first evangelist in the New Testament. It was that love that led her to go back to her town and to tell everybody, y'all got to come see this dude. Let me show it to you. Drop down to verse 27 of John 4. It says, just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. The disciples were like, why is this dude talking to this American woman? Doesn't he know? But no one dared ask, what do you want? And why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Translation, he told me everything about me and he didn't judge me. He knew everything about me, but he still loved me. Y'all got to come and see this dude. Y'all got to come and experience this kind of love. It says that they came out of the town and made their way towards him. He dropped down around verse 39. And it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. There was revival that broke out in that town just because of the love of God. Just because this woman got a revelation of how deeply loved by God she was. Now, what is the revelation for us? What's the point? Every time, listen to me, that we dare to meet God in the vulnerability of our sin and our shame and our mistakes, every time we take off the fig leaves and we experience God in real nakedness, we encounter the love of God in radical ways. But every time we fall back into self-improvement mode, every time we put the fig leaves back on and we try to approach God like we got it all together, we fail to experience that radical, extravagant love of God. See, we only know God's unconditional, radical, reckless love when we dare approach him just the way that we are. 
the more you have the courage to approach God in your weakness, in your shame, in your sin, the more you will get to know how truly and deeply loved by God that you are. Y'all real quiet this morning. Maybe you're processing it. Let me see if I can explain it to you this way. I, a couple years ago, had LASIK surgery. I have been wearing glasses since I was probably around three years old or so. I've been wearing glasses for a very, very long time. And I had really, really, really bad, uh, you know, prescription. So, you know, the kids used to make fun of me when I was growing up because I had the Coke bottle glasses. And then when I got older trying to, trying to be hip and cool, I had to pay extra money for them to take the really thick lens and make it really small. And my wife had been on me for several, several years, like, Hey, just get the LASIK surgery, spend all this money on glasses. But I got this thing about people in my eyes. I got this just this weird phobia, fear, whatever you want to call it. I don't like stuff in my eye. I don't like people poking around my eye. Just, I, 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 just drives me crazy. And so she was like, you got to get the surgery, you got to get the surgery. I was like, no, because they got to get in my eye. I don't want nobody in my eye. And, and she kept pushing me. And so we were having a conversation with some friends one day. And they were like, oh, man, you should get the surgery. We've had it. It's no big deal. As a matter of fact, Bishop Omer and some of our other friends had the surgery. And I was like, all right, all right, all right. I will get the surgery if I go to your doctor because y'all look good. So I'm going to go to your doctor. And that's what we did. We, we, we got on a plane one day and flew all the way to California just to go to the same doctor they went to. And it got to the doctor's office, maybe about 9 that morning, and uh, came in. They said, well, and Mr. Moody, we're ready, ready for you. We just want to examine your eyes one more time to make sure nothing changed. And they looked at my eyes and they said, all right, great. I want you to take this. They gave me a Xanax. And I was like, okay, you know, no big deal. I took a Xanax. I was still a little nervous. They said, all right, great. Sit in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you in just a moment. Sat there about 20 minutes. And then uh, they came and uh, the doctor came and sent the nurse rather. And uh, the nurse said, hey, the doctor's ready for you. I want you to take one more of these. I said, oh, okay. Took it. They said, well, come on. Come on, doctor is ready for you. So then I go into the, the, the operating room, and the doctor right in the corner has got another kind of apparatus that he looks at your eyes one more time. He says, come on in, Mr. Moody. Let me just check your eyes one more time. And then he checks my eyes. He says, oh, man, it's perfect. Okay, we're ready for the surgery. He says, won't you take one more of these? <laughs> now, by the time I lay down on the table, Doctor's like, you ready? I'm like, hey, I'm good, doc. How you doing? How your mom and them doing? I'm good. Man. Let's do this thing. Now, and the camera has got, um, the, 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 the laser, rather, has got a camera on it. And so they, they are doing this surgery on my eyes, and the camera is pointed down on my eyes, and it cutting my irises and all of that. And my wife is in the waiting room right next door with this huge big screen, and she sees all of the stuff that they're doing to my eyes. And my wife is like, Ugh. oh, my God, that's so nasty. That's so disgusting. And I get up off the table, and it's a miracle. I can see 2020. And they say, well, we're going to take you to your wife. And they give me another Xanax, by the way. And they, 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 my wife was like, oh, my God, that was the nastiest thing I ever heard. How could you do that? I was like, I'm cool. Because it was something about the Xanax. It felt like a warm blanket. It felt like a, like a warm blanket was coming up my spine and like somebody just wrapped me in a warm blanket and hugged me real tight. And I was laying there like, oh, this feels so good. <laughs> I tell you that story because what I'm trying to tell you is the love of God is better than Xanax. The, the love of God is like that warm blanket that wraps you. And when the love of God wraps you, all your fears, all your phobias, all your worries, all your anxieties goes away. And you're like, God, thank you. I'm so so glad to be loved by you. You've got to know how deeply loved by God you are. But here's the second and final thing. If you're going to know yourself, here's a big one. Secondly and finally, you have to know your ignored parts of self. You have to know your ignored Parts of self. See, knowing yourself has to involve encountering, listen to me, and embracing previously unwelcome parts of yourself. 
Now, for some of you, you're probably thinking, what do you mean? Because we tend to think, oh, I, I, I'm just me. I'm just me, and this is who I am, and this is all that I am, and so take it or leave it. Yeah, but within you, there are different parts yeah. of you. Now, that's not really a problem. The problem lies in the fact that we often don't know those other parts of ourselves. Those other parts of ourselves are sometimes unknown to us. And what's interesting is, while they may sometimes be oblivious to us, other people recognize them. I was a chaplain many years ago at a maximum security prison, and my supervisor, his name was A.J. Sabri. I'll never forget it, because after my, my time serving there had come to an end, all of the, the chaplains and training and stuff, he, he wrote us an assessment, and it was, it was really nice. He had a very strong prophetic gift, and he wrote this really nice letter, and we were all kind of in a session, in a group kind of counseling session, and um, he read it to all of us and then gave us the piece of paper, and I still have it, uh, and it's framed at home. And, and he, you know, talked about in that assessment our strengths, but then he also got real pointed and started pointing out areas of us that we didn't really uh, want to deal with. And so he, when he came to me, his writer, he, he, he literally said, God's going to use you, Van, in some very specific ways, and you've got this gift, and God's going to use you to do this, that, and the other. But then he got to the other part. He says, but here's, here's the problem. You're going to really struggle with people who are not real. He said, you don't, you don't play the game well. You don't politic well. You, you, don't, you don't do the pretend stuff well, and you're going to really struggle because everybody's not going to be as genuine as you are. I mean, he read me to the rights. And I got that, I'm in the group, and I'm like, man, you don't know me like that. <laughs> but I'll never forget that because he was extremely right. See, at that time, he saw parts in me that I didn't even know were there. See, there are important aspects about us. The reason I tell you that story is, is for this reason. There are important aspects about us that we ignore. For example... A lot of times we refuse to face our feelings of shame because they make us feel too vulnerable. So what do we do? We pretend that they don't exist. And what we hope is that they'll just go away. Or maybe it's our brokenness. Maybe it's the hurt and the woundedness that, that, that exists in us, but we try to deny it. But when we try to deny those things, they don't go away. They simply go into hiding. And they actually exert more control and influence over our lives. I'm going to talk, come back to that in just a moment. But, but you need to know that there are other parts in you that often we like to ignore. But if you're going to know yourself, you, you've got to address them. For example, if I only know my strong, competent self, and I am never able to embrace my weak or insecure self, then I'm forced to live a lie. And at every moment, I got to pretend that I'm always strong and competent. If, if I refuse to face my deceitful self, I live an illusion, a lie regarding my own integrity. Or, or if I am unwilling to face my prideful self, you know what? I live in an illusion of my own humility. What am I trying to teach you? There is enormous value in naming and coming to know those excluded parts of yourself, your playful self, your cautious self, your, your, your exhibitionist self, your pleasing self, your sexual self, your competitive self. There is extreme importance and value in coming to face all of those other parts of yourself, whether or not you like to acknowledge their presence or not. Now, what happens when we're children is that we are conditioned to want to put away the parts of self that, that are not pleasing to people. Oh, don't do that, Johnny. That's not good. And so then Johnny grows up thinking, well, well, well that's, that's something I, I got in me, but let me just put that in the dark. Let me hide that because that's not the pleasing, acceptable self that people want to see. But here's the point. The parts of ourselves that are not given a place at the table of our lives, they don't go away. They go into hiding, but they don't, become weaker, they actually become stronger because they operate out of sight and beyond awareness and they exert increasing influence over who we are. Oh, that's good I'm going to go deeper since you're just taking it all in. Part of the reason that people do stuff in the dark 
is because there's still parts of them that live in the dark. Part of the reason is stuff like pornography and, and other addictions exhibit so much power over people's lives is because there's parts of them that live in the dark where that stuff exerts power. Parts of you that you ignore, that you like to say, oh, it's not there. No, 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 no. We've got to expose it. We've got to give it a seat at the table of your life and what God wants to do is he wants to touch it and heal it with his love. And he will use that into um, and use it into the creation or the making of the new person that he's called you to be. We often talk about how in Christ all things are made new. But God uses our old self to make us new. He uses some of the stuff in us, good and bad, to make us into this new individual that is Christ-like. If we allow him to. In Ephesians 5, 11, it says, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Why? Because when they exist in the darkness, they exert more power over your lives. John says that, that, that the light came in Christ and, and the darkness had to flee. The darkness comprehended it not. Why? Because when light shines, darkness has to go. A part of what I'm teaching you is we've got to learn to open the door to even the dark parts of our lives and allow the light of Christ and importantly the love of Christ to shine in on those things. And to do that, that means we got to welcome all of us, not just the stage us, not just the, the, the Monday morning meeting us. Hi, John, how are you? How was your weekend? I'm good. No, not just that part of us. We've got to welcome all of us. To the table of our lives and allow the love of God to touch and heal and transform that part of us this is why I started off saying you got to know how deeply loved by God you are because if you know that God accepts you just as you are then it also helps you to accept yourself yeah. teach Bishop I am that's the only way towards genuine spiritual transformation self-acceptance and self-knowing are deeply interconnected. To truly know something about yourself, you have to accept it. Even the things that you deeply want to change about you, you first have got to accept them. I want to lose some weight. Okay, you got to accept that first before you go putting on the skinny jeans. <laughs> Self-transformation always precedes is preceded by, rather, self-acceptance. You can't change what you won't acknowledge. You, 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 you cannot transform. Make me new. Lord, make me over. We used to sing that song back in the day. Okay, but, but what is it that God needs to touch? What, what is it? What's in there? See, any hope that you can know yourself without accepting things about you, that even the things you wish were not true, it's an illusion. Part of the reason we go through the motions and we don't experience some of the real change that God wants to bring is because we won't acknowledge it. And, and here's the thing. God's love of us, it's not an excuse. And it will not prevent the transforming work that God wants to do in our lives. But what God is saying is, I, I need you to let me into that part of your life. We got to kind of befriend the self that we seek to know. You, you got to receive all of you with hospitality, not hostility. You, you got to be able to say, come, come on in. I got a chair for you. You the cussing. I got you the cussing one. I got a chair for you. I, the attitude. I got a chair for you. You know, the anger. I got a chair. I got a chair for you. I mean, like, you got to invite it all to the table because God loves it all. And he wants to touch it all. He wants to transform it all. A great example of this is the life of Peter. Because I want to make sure you get some Bible on this. Um, in Luke 5 and verse 4, when Peter first meets Jesus, watch this. Jesus is preaching. He needs to use Peter's boat as a platform. Gets in the boat, tells Peter, push out a little bit so that I can teach the people. 
And then in verse 4 of Luke 5, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners and other boats to come and help them. And when they came and filled their boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter, here it is, saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet. He fell at Jesus' knees, this translation says, and says, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish people. You will fish for people, rather. Some translations say, follow me. So notice this. Peter acknowledges that he is a sinner. And what does Jesus say? All right, cool, let's roll. You need to get that. He says, Lord, I'm a sinner. He says, all right, cool. Let's go. You're going to fish for people. I, I, this is not even really a part of the message, but can I ask you something? If God loves you and accepts you as a sinner, how can you do any less? But here's the deeper point. Even though Peter confesses in this first encounter that Jesus, I'm a sinner, Jesus still knows, listen to me, that there's some stuff in Peter, some ignored parts of Peter that he hasn't dealt with. And so on multiple occasions, Jesus is saying to Peter, you're going to have to deal with that. But Peter does what a lot of us do. He pretends like it's not there. Let me show it to you. In Matthew 26 and verse 31, Jesus told them this very night, He's getting ready to go to the cross. He says, this very night, you all will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've risen, I'm going to go on ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied, well, well, listen, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. He's like, I don't know about none of these other jokers, Jesus, but let me just tell you how I roll, I will never fall away from you. And then Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, see, he's doubling down. But Peter declared, even if I got to die with you, I'll never disown you. And then all of the other disciples said the same. They're like, yeah, whatever he said, yeah, we, yeah. That's, 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 that's right. Say it, Peter. Then on another occasion in, in Luke 22, once again, Jesus is trying to point out, Peter, you got some some ignored parts of yourself that you got to deal with. He says in in verse 31 of Luke 22, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan is trying to use some of your ignored parts of yourself to demolish you, to derail your destiny. He says, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. He's trying to say, you got some stuff in your heart. You got some stuff in the the deep recesses of your soul that if you don't acknowledge it, the enemy is going to use it to mess you up. But I prayed for you, man. And God wants you to deal with it so you can strengthen your brothers who have their own stuff. But notice what, what Peter does. He doubles down in pretending. He says, no, 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 Lord. I am ready to go with you to the prison and the death. And Jesus answered, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. You will deny three times that you know me. Every time Jesus is saying, you, uh, you got some stuff, man. You got some ignored parts. And Peter's like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's kind of like when somebody says, I know you're hurting. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, and people say, no, that's I'm praying for you. You've been on my heart. I'm good. I'm, you know, I mean, you know, use your prayers for somebody else. I'm good. And then, if you know the story, Jesus is being bounced around from court to court. The disciples scatter. Peter's following at a distance. And he tries to warm himself by the fire. And there's this little girl. Everybody's sitting around the fire trying to warm themselves. And she says, uh, Hey, what are you 
with him? No, I wasn't with him. What you talking about? What? I wasn't with him. She said, all right, maybe I'm mistaken, and they keep warming themselves by the fire. And, wait, wait a minute now. Your face really stands out. What, you with him? You were with him. Woman, I said I wasn't with him. What I, t- what I tell you? I, you don't know me? Okay. And they're warming themselves by the fire, and then the girl says, wait, wait, wait a minute. You, you were with him. I wasn't with him. I told you how many times I got to tell you in the rooster crow. The Bible says he goes away weeping. Why? Because it was at that moment that that ignored part of him reared its ugly head. This this need to be pleasing to people, this need to be well-liked and accepted by people, this, this, this need to be the guy and to have everybody like him and to stick his chest out and walk with bravado so everybody knows that he's the man, like that thing comes out and he goes away weeping and he's so broken over it that he tries to leave ministry altogether now Jesus told him in the very beginning you're going to stop fishing for fish and fish for people but what does Peter do he goes back to his business he says man I, I'm done why does he say I'm done because he's embarrassed but remember remember God's love is all encompassing so in John 21 he's out fishing all night, they don't catch anything, and then they're coming back to the shore, and lo and behold, Jesus is there. Wow. And he's got fish on the barbecue. <laughs> and, and Jesus says, hey, uh, how'd y'all do out there? Did y'all catch anything? He already knew they didn't catch nothing. But he's trying to just make the subtle point, y'all can't do it without me. He says, hey, have y'all caught anything? And, 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 and Peter says, no, we, we hadn't called anything. He says, well, come on in. I, I got food here. And they eat by the fire because Peter denied him by the fire. And then, and then he says to Simon Peter, pick me up in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? More than these, these, more than people more than the need to be well liked more than the need to prove to everybody that you're the man well, yes lord you, you you know that that i love you feed my lambs again jesus said now, simon son of john do 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 you love me and he answered well, well yes yes lord you you know that i love you and Jesus said, well, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said, well, Simon, son of John, do, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? But why did Jesus ask him three times? Because he denied him three times. Because he was trying to say, I, I, was, I was trying to get you to pay attention to those ignored parts of you that you tried to pretend were not there, but it was those ignored parts of you that led you to deny me. And so I've got to ask you three times because I want you to look at that and deal with that because you cannot become other than who you are until you acknowledge who you are. Teach Bishop, I'm doing that. You you cannot become more than you are until you acknowledge who you are. And I know we got some deep, deep thinkers in the room or online. You're thinking, what, what, what about crucifying your flesh? The Bible says we're supposed to crucify our flesh. Bishop, you're talking about acknowledging it. No, but you can't crucify what you won't acknowledge. Yes. Jesus says, if you're going to come after me and be my disciple, you, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross. You can't take up the cross that you won't acknowledge. Yes. And then follow me. The things about ourselves that we refuse to acknowledge, that we refuse to address, they are given increasing power over us and increasing influence over us. But it's when we acknowledge them, it's when we open the door and allow the light to shine into the dark areas of our lives that we really strip them of the power that they've been exerting over our lives. So accepting those parts of you that, that God wants to touch, that God wants to transform, doesn't make you weak. It actually makes you strong. Yeah. Yeah. Because
because as long as you keep them in the closet, they will continue to exert more and more and more power and influence over your life. I've had people say, I just, I just don't understand why, why, I, why I do this. I say, oh, I, I don't understand why I do it. Because you won't acknowledge it. Yeah. Because you act like it's not there. And as long as you act like it's not there, it's the puppet master controlling wow. your life. I'm going to close with this. There was this Greek and Russian folk tale about a man who was approaching the door of his house and he realized that he lost his key. And so he got down on the ground, he was trying to find his key. He was looking all around, he couldn't find it. And then he backed up because there was a lantern and thought, well, let me look around here where there's more light. And he's looking for his key and he can't find it. And then a friend comes along and sees him and says, hey, hey, what are you doing? He says, I can't find my key. And so the friend gets down to try to help him find the key. And the friend says, hey, do you know the last place that you had it where maybe you lost it? He said, oh, yeah, it's in the house. And the friend said, well, why are you looking for it out here? He said, I, I don't know. I just thought the light was better out here. So often we're like that man. We think that the key to success, the key to happiness, the key to fulfillment is on the outside. And so we're searching in all of these areas for all of these things for this key that's lost, but the key is not lost on the outside. It's lost on the inside. You know, it's interesting. When Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you pray, go into your private room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in that secret place. And you know what we do so often? We, we take that literally and we, I got to get in my prayer closet. I got a closet in my house and that's where I pray. But you know what I believe? I don't think that was meant to be taken literally. I think the prayer closet, the secret place, is in here. It's, it's in the darkness. The dark areas and crevices of our lives, the stuff that we're trying to hide, it's where we, we open that door and say, Christ, come in. God, come in. God wants to come into all of the dark areas of your life. And he's not coming to judge. He's not coming to condemn. He's coming with his love to transform. But we've got to acknowledge that they're there. And we've got to open our heart and every space of our lives for him to come in. A couple of weekends ago, right here at this altar, we had tons of young people during our Emerge night of worship, crying out for God. And there was young, one young girl who was at the altar and had an encounter with God and Holy Spirit told her to leave the altar and she came over to that side of the sanctuary and she knelt down and she just started crying out, God, you can have all of me. You, you can have all of me. Come into all of me, she kept yelling. Come into all of me. Come into all of me. That's the cry that God is listening for from some of us. Not just coming to my, my good me. Not just coming to my made up me. Not just coming to my professional me. Come into all of me. All of me. So I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But I sense so strongly that God is knocking. He's saying, will you let me in? He's not coming to judge. He's not coming to condemn. He's coming with a reckless love that wants to bring out all of that dark stuff into the marvelous light of the love of God.
I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, you know who we are. You know where we are. You see the stuff we try to hide. Just like that Samaritan woman. We can't pretend with you. Lord, help us to acknowledge everything that's in us so that all of it can be touched by your love. Now, Lord, I know that this message is a kind of surgery on the heart and in the souls of people but I pray that we would not resist that we would yield right now just like that young girl did that the cry of our heart would be Lord come into all of us Lord I thank you for your love for us I thank you that there's nothing that we could ever do to stop your love for us. I thank you, Father. And in this moment, we receive that love into the deep and dark areas of our soul. Right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Listen, I feel so strongly. There's a number of things that Holy Spirit's saying to some of you. And we got to go. We're a little over our time. But I just want to encourage you to yield to whatever the Lord is saying. Our prayer team is going to get in position. They're going to be on the sides here of the altar. They're going to put a QR code up on the screen. If, if the decision for you is to get to know the Lord, maybe that's the first step for you. You can do that by way of that QR code. If there's another decision that God is asking you to make in this moment, you can make it by way of that QR code. Maybe you have been trying to do life by yourself. And the decision that God is calling for you to make is to be a part of a community. One of the things I'm so proud of our church for being is when people come and talk about, man, how loving people were here at the worship center and, and how they were treated so well. That's a part of what it means to be in a faith community because there is no judgment or condemnation in this house. There can't be if we are the children of God. If we serve a God who loves us unconditionally, then guess what? We're supposed to love others unconditionally. And so maybe, maybe your decision is to get connected to a church family, or maybe God has placed some things on your heart through this message that you want to touch and agree with the prayer team on. They're getting in position and will be here to pray with you if you need prayer for anything. How many of you are blessed today? Amen. Come on, would you stand? Our prayer team is going to be to the left and to the right of me at the altars. If you need prayer for anything, I and uh, some of the campus pastors will be down here at the center. If you're new to our faith community or if you want to get connected or just want to come and shake my hand or shake some of the other campus pastor's hands, I'd love to greet you. I'd love to welcome you. I'd love to just say thanks for coming. If you got feedback, you want to tell us, you preach too long, I'll receive that too. Uh, <laughs> Deacon Dale said, pray about it, Bishop. But either way, we just want you to know how much we love you, how much we are grateful to have you here. Guest. Thank you for being here. Online family, our team is back in the studio and they're ready to greet you through Talk Back. Family, let me speak this over your life and then we will dismiss. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray that this week, your peace and your comfort would be with your people. I also pray, Lord, that this week, you would continue to remind us of this word and that we would do the deep work to allow you into every part of us and that you would wash us God like that Xanax did to me and that warm blanket cover us with your love every part of us in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus 
Be with your people, Lord. Bless them as they leave. Bless this week. Bless their families. Bless everything that their hands touch for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. God bless you, family. See you next week. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is here. Guests, friends, if you want to just connect with us, I and our campus pastors will be down front. Take care, family. We love you.